In this video, I wanted to have a look at some of the more unusual or rarer types of supernova, and these are called type 1b and type 1c. So the most common ones or the ones you've probably come across if you looked into supernovas at some point are type 1a and type 2. Now type 1a are due to like a white dwarf pulling material off a nearby star and type 2 is like a core collapse of a massive star. And type 1b and 1c are both and neither at the same time, which we'll have a look at. So a recap of type 1a, if you haven't come across those before, these are typically thermonuclear. So here you have a white dwarf star, which is pulling material off likely a nearby red dwarf, red giant even. So that red giant swells up, the white dwarf pulls material off, that white dwarf grows in mass, and when it gets to a critical mass, which is with about 1.4 solar masses, the white dwarf approaches the ignition temperature of carbon, which is predominantly what it's made of, because it's the leftover core from a, a, a sun-like star. It then goes supernova. Now, because it always happens at the same mass, it supposedly happens with the same energy. They are then the same brightness as each other, so you can use them to measure distances in the universe, and they're very useful, basically. So type 1a are very useful, and they typically come from this sort of binary system. Um, now type 1 don't have any hydrogen so this is actually true for all type 1 not just 1a when you measure the spectrum of light coming from a supernova a type 1 they don't have any hydrogen and that's because the white dwarf star that goes supernova doesn't have any hydrogen in it it's based mostly the carbon that's uh, ignited and resulted in this supernova they don't have any hydrogen very important thing so type 2 are from the death of massive stars. So this is when a star bigger than the sun, so these are the, the biggest stars in the universe, once they come to the end of their life, they've stopped fusion in their core, then gravitational forces basically collapse it, and you get a rebound, so it basically overshoots the neutron degeneracy pressure, which is what would hold up that core. It then rebounds, and then you get a shock wave propagating outwards through the outer layers, that then basically gives you your supernova. And this is known as a core collapse supernova. So type 2, it's from the, the core collapsing at the end of its life, not from pulling material off and then having like a, a different sort of supernova. So this is a, a key difference, really. Now, because of that, if you look at the spectrum of light from a type 2, you would see hydrogen because the outer layers of these massive stars is still hydrogen. Even though the central core, the centre part of the star, has used all of its hydrogen, depending on how big it is, it would have done some helium fusion as well and some other elements, but it still has a very large amount of hydrogen in its outer layers, which are not at the right temperature for fusion. So it, when you measure the light, to look at the light, you still see hydrogen there. So type 1, no hydrogen. Type 2, they do. Now, a type 2 would also leave behind a dense stellar remnant. By that, we mean something like a neutron star, a black hole, a pulsar. The Crab Nebula here has a pulsar in its centre, which is just a, a very fast rotating neutron star. So they leave behind this very dense, compact stellar remnant. A type 1a typically would not. So during the white dwarf when it actually went supernova, it would mostly destroy the star and it wouldn't have anything left behind. So the type 1a wouldn't leave behind any remnants of the star that went supernova, whereas the type 2, you get behind that, basically that really dense core that's collapsed afterwards. So when we start to have a look at the type 1a, the 1b and 1c, well, specifically here the 1a and 1b, the light curves very early on when they first occur, appear quite similar. So if you haven't come across a light curve before, this is when you measure the brightness of an astronomical object and you keep taking measurements and then over time you get this kind of plot. So during a type 1a supernova you get a sudden increase in brightness and then it slowly dims down. And type 1a and 1b, they look quite similar early on. So they don't have any hydrogen, both don't have hydrogen, and they look quite similar in the way that their brightness behaves early on. However, if you were to look at the spectrum of light from the 1b supernova, it wouldn't have hydrogen, which we already know, but it also doesn't show any silicon. Now, a type 1a would show silicon, 
and it would also show strong helium lines, which a type 1A would not show. So there are differences in the spectrum of light between a 1A, 1B, and also 1C as well. So this is kind of one of the key differences which can help identify which type they're going to be. So this is where it gets interesting. So a type 1B is a core collapse supernova. It's nothing like a type 1A actually. It's when the core of a big star actually collapses. But for some reason in these supernovas, the outer layer of hydrogen that would have been there in that massive star when it went into the core collapse phase is, is missing. It's been lost before it collapsed. So actually you're left with mostly the central part of the star the core that's actually collapsing and maybe some of the outer layers around that that don't contain hydrogen so this is the key difference actually it's actually a type 2 but it appears like a type 1 so here you would have the core that collapses you have the hydrogen which has been lost before the collapse but in a type 1b you still have this helium around the core or you still have an outer helium layer which remains there, which is why we're picking up those strong helium lines in the spectrum. Now, a type 1c is the same as a 1b, but this time round, even the helium has been lost before it's collapsed. So this time round, you wouldn't pick up any hydrogen or helium. So the 1b and the 1c, they're basically the same thing. It's just missing helium as well. So it's kind of gone a step further and it's lost more of its outer layers this time around compared to the 1B. But it's the same process that's occurring. So in essence, the 1B, 1C, they are type 2 that mimic a type 1 because they appear to be type 1 initially. But when you look at them in a bit more detail, they're actually occurring in the same manner a type 2 would. In fact, they are a type 2, they're just missing some parts of it, so, which makes them look like a type 1. So, how does it actually lose that outer layer? So here you've got some very large stars. So these are the most massive stars, or some of the most massive stars in the universe. And they actually are so luminous, so bright, they actually lose the outer layers. They've got such a enormous outward pressure from the energy they're generating that they can actually lose their outer layers because the gravitational forces are starting to become overcome so this is an image of one of those stars and you can see it's actually blowing away or losing some of its outer layers because of that really high luminosity so if you actually have a look at the hr diagram which is a plot of stars that have been measured the luminosity plotted against their surface temperature and you have a diagonal down the centre, which is the main sequence. So this is where stars are essentially fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. And it's the main part of their evolution. Then they kind of wander about as a result of that. But there's an upper limit, really, to how luminous a star can be. And it's known as the Eddington limit. This is how bright a star can be before it actually begins to overcome gravitational forces holding it together. And it's at that upper part there. So when a star is on the main sequence or it's happy just sitting there not doing a great deal, it's in hydrostatic equilibrium. So it means that the gravitational forces trying to collapse it are balanced by an outward pressure which is being generated in the core. So you're generating all this energy. It's actually causing an outward pressure which supports it against gravitational collapse. So this is hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, at the Eddington limit for these very massive stars, they start to produce an enormous outward pressure, which can begin or it actually gets to the upper limit of balancing that gravity. So the Eddington limit is a maximum luminosity a body can attain when it is in hydrostatic equilibrium. If it goes beyond that, then it actually is going to pretty much blow itself to pieces, it's going to lose its outer layers. And there are stars that are pretty much at the Eddington limit, which are the stars we're interested in for these types of supernova. So on these massive stars, you typically get a bit of a layering occurring. So the hydrogen is going to be on the outer side, then you can have some helium, and they're almost layered like an onion. And because of that increase in gas pressure outwards, against that gravitational force the outer layers begin to be lost so you start to lose those outer layers and that can then expose the more central parts of the star and then at some point when it comes to the end of its life those layers aren't there for when the supernova occurs so the supernova 
occurs without the outer layers because they've already been lost prior to getting to that point because they've already lost them due to being very close to this upper limit. And these type of stars typically sit on the upper part of the HR diagram there. Now, when they go through their evolutionary phase, they do wander about a little bit, but they're pretty much at the top there. They're at the maximum luminosity. They also have quite high surface temperatures. Again, because they're losing their outer layer, they're exposing the hotter parts of the star inside. So they are they appear very hot as well. So that was one way they can lose their outer layers to then undergo a type 1b, 1c supernova. But another way could be that maybe it's the same as a type 1a. So you've got a white dwarf star, you've got another star, it pulls material off. But if that second star that's having the material pulled off it is actually a bigger star to start with, then it will go through a, a, like a type 2 core collapse supernova anyway but it's already lost its outer layers to the other star prior to doing it. So another mechanism that can pull those outer layers off is if it's in a close binary, quite similar to the type 1a, but you've just got a bigger star there. So the star that's had the outer layers pulled off will go supernova as well. So this is another mechanism that can actually cause it. And these ones can be a little bit problematic sometimes because, because they do mimic the type 1a, which are useful for distant measurements. We need to make sure that it's a type 1b, 1c, 1a before we start doing some distant measurements because obviously we're going to get an incorrect answer or distance if we don't know which one it is. So thank you for watching and if you enjoy then check out some of the other videos.